one and welcome to the Torah portion of our service. We just enjoyed our Torah processional together and now it's time to read the Torah. Let me move this over a little bit. Let's all stand and join me as we recite the blessing before reading the Torah. Baruchu et Adonai amvivorach Baruch et Adonai amvivorach leolam vayed Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher b'karvanu mikol ha'amim Venetan lanu et Torato Baruch atah Adonai noten ha-Torah Amen Bless Adonai who is blessed Blessed is Adonai who is blessed forever and ever Blessed are you Adonai our God, King of the Universe who selected us from all the nations and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Today's Torah portion, Vayetze, is, can be found in the book of Genesis chapter 28, starting at verse 10. And I'm going to read in Hebrew down to verse 15. It says in the Hebrew, Vayetse Yaakov Mibir Shava Vayelech Harana. Vayifga Bamakom Vayelen Sham Kiva Hashemesh Vayichach Me Avne Hamakom Vayasem Mera Ashotav Vayishkav Bamakom Chahu Vayar Halom Vayar Halom Vichine Bear with me one sec here. Here we go. Vehine Malache Elohim Olim. Let me restart the line again. Vaya Halom Vehine Sulam Mutsav Artsa Versho Magia Hashemaima Vehine Malache Elohim Olim Veyordim Bo Vehine Adonai Nitzav alav, vayomer ani Adonai, Elohe Avraham avicha, ve Elohe Itzak haaretz, asher ata shochev, alecha lecha et nen et nena ule zarecha, vechaya zarecha ka afar haaretz, ufaratta. Yama Vakedma Vetsefona Venegba Venevrehu Vehako Mishpehot Adama Uveza Recha Vehine Anohi Imach Ush Martiha Behol Asher Telech Vehashivo Tiha Elcha Adama Hazot Ki Lo I Ezovcha Ad Asher Im Asiti Et Asher Dibarti Lach. If you'd like to follow along, we'll be reading in English. 
Genesis 28, starting in verse 10. Yaakov went out from Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed the night there. Because the sun had set, he took a stone from the place and put it under his head and lay down there to sleep. He dreamt that there before him was a ladder resting on the ground with its top reaching to the heaven, and the angels of Adonai were going up and down on it. Then suddenly Adonai was standing there next to him, and he said, I am Adonai, the God of Avraham, the God of Itzhak, the land on which you are lying, I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the grains of dust on the earth. You will expand to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. By you, your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Look, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will bring you back into this land because I won't leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, Truly, Adonai is in this place, and I didn't know it. Then he became afraid and said, This place is fearsome. This has to be the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Yaakov got up early in the morning, took the stone he had put under his head, and set it up as a standing stone, poured olive oil on its top, and named the place Bet-El. But the town had originally been called Lutz. Yaakov took this vow, if God will be with me and will guard me on this road that I am traveling, giving me bread to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return to my father's house in peace, then Adonai will be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a standing stone, will be God's house. And of everything you give me, I will faithfully return one-tenth to you. Hallelujah. Join me as we recite the blessing after reading the Torah. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher netan lanu Torah emet Vechai olam netan betochenu Baruch Adonai Noten haTorah Amen Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe. You have given us the Torah of truth and planted within us everlasting life. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Thank you, Stacy. Today is a very interesting portion. Um, since we've been gone the last couple of weeks, it's come upon me really quickly. Um, and in preparing this, um, I didn't go the direction I thought I would go, but I have some things here that are very important, very important. Um, since you're here for the first time here in your first Torah portion, listen to it. Listen to the whole thing because you're going to hear some things that you've never heard that may make you feel like, oh, hang on a second. But inside, you're going to say, you know what, that's right. I may not understand it, but I know inside it's right. So I challenge you, all of you, with that uh, idea today. There was a saying that came about, I think, in the 17 or 1800s, and what the saying is based on is, um, you, you can imagine a time uh, like in the American Midwest. You have a family, and... You know, they didn't bathe the whole lot, and they were just working. And it wasn't like today where we have showers. We just go in, and you shower, and this kind of thing. So however often it was every week or every month, when the water was put in a tub, yeah, the father would take a bath. Then after that, the mother would take a bath. The same water. And then you'd have the children, starting from the oldest down to the youngest, taking a bath. 
And then you finally got to the youngest one, the baby. So by the time the baby took a bath, the water was so dirty and nasty that they would say, hey, don't throw the baby out with the bath water. So I'm saying all that to say this portion, we're going to get into some deeper things. And what I want you to remind yourself is this. When you hear something that sounds new or sounds different, what are you going to remind yourself of? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen? Parashat Vayetse, the complete portion can be found in the book of Bereshit, Genesis chapter 28, 10 through 32, 3. And again, I wasn't here two weeks ago for Parashat Chaye Serah, but I appreciate those of you who were here and you read through the portion together. Um, I talked about the life of Serah, the death, her death, her burial, the... Uh, her, the birth of her children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was two weeks ago. Last week's portion. Let's see here. I have it here. Haye Sarah, for those of you who want to go back and read it, is Genesis 23, 1 through 25, 18. Okay. Last week's portion was Parashat Tol Dot. Say Tol Dot. Or generations which is found in the book of Bereshit, Genesis chapter 25, 19 through 28, 9. And we all know that the Torah portions are all linked together, in particular when they're consecutive. You know, the story continues when you see the mother, she gives birth, you know, and then her children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's clear when you study, you see the beginning uh, when you study the uh, Parashat told Dot last week's, you see the beginning of something happening. You see the beginning of two houses being formed or two kingdoms being established. The kingdom of Yaakov on one hand and the kingdom of Esau or Esav in Hebrew. The title of Parashat told Dot shows something very interesting. The portion starts off by Ele Todot Itzach. These are the generations of Isaac. The word todot is the plural of the word toda, which is generation. When you see ot on the end of a Hebrew word, it means plural. Todot, generations. So it can mean generations. It can mean history or descendants or a few other things. You have to read it in context to get the exact meaning of what it means. Typical Hebrew for you. So the words of Torah, always remember that the author, who's the author of Torah? God, Adonai, the Father, right? He's always trying to tell us something. He's always trying to, he's trying to convey a message. And I want to look at what this message that he's trying to convey. We're going to go back to Toldot since we weren't here last week. We're going to combine these together. The first time the word Toldot was used in Scripture, it's in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And it's spelled, um, Tav, Vav, Lamed, Dalit, Vav, Tav. And you hear two Vavs in there. Because the Vav in the word Toldot, it is the O sound, Tol, Dot. Says in there twice. Everybody follow me on that? Because it's really important while we're talking about this. But after that first mention of this word in Torah, something strange happens. Has anybody ever heard this before? About the two vavs? Two vavs? No? 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> heard and forgot. Okay. That's okay too. I might do the same thing next week. All right. So, but something strange happens after Genesis 24, or 2.4. Every time it's spelled after this in Torah, it's spelled with at least one of the vavs missing. Interesting. The vavs in the word toldot make the sound o in tol and o in dot. This happens concerning the generations of Esav in Genesis 36.1. The first Vav is missing. Genesis 25, 19 
concerning the generations of Yitzhak, the second Vav is missing. And in Genesis 25, 12, when talking about Toldot of Ishmael, both Vavs are missing. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch was a German Orthodox rabbi. And I'm going to paraphrase something that he wrote concerning this. Each Hebrew word has a three-letter root. So tol would be tav, vav, lamed. That's the root. Okay? Told, and then you have the da at the end of it. The first vav is in the beginning of the word. It represents the root of the word or the, the essence of the word. You know, the Hebrew word, if you go back to the roots, that's where you get the true essence and the true, um, the fundamental meaning of it. That makes sense? That has the moral, spiritual essence of the word or the internal part of the word. The second vav has to do with uh, the plurality because it makes it plural, right? More than one toll, more than one generation. Toll dot, toll da, singular, toll dot, plural. And not just two, but plural, multiplication. That makes sense? It has to do with plurality, outward expansion, and numeric growth, etc. So Esau, or Esav, has the vav which makes the word plural, or numerous, which you can connect to the numerous descendants of Esau. Plenty of generations from Esau who represent the 22 Arab nations that surround tiny little Israel today. But they're missing one vav, which is connected to the root of the word. But they have the vav that, that means many people. That makes sense? Plurality. The descendants of Esav, Edom, some was asked earlier about the Edomites, uh, typically referred to as the Jordanians, but it's not just limited to that. That's the, Edom is the descendants of Esau. Edom are large in number, multiplication and plurality, but they lack the first vav. They lack the spiritual essence and connection to Adonai, connection to Hashem, the name as we refer to him, with that missing vav in the root of the word. Their connection to Adonai doesn't exist. And stay with me. I know this gets kind of, I try to make this as simple as I could, but it's complicated. Whereas Yitzhak's generations, which are headed by Yaakov, Jacob, who was called Israel, its toldot does not have the vav which makes the word plural or numerous, but it has the vav in the root of the word. It has the vav which characterizes the moral spiritual essence of the word and the internal part of the word showing the connection to Adonai. The writer of Torah which represents the true kingdom of God. However, at this point they're still missing their plurality, their expansion, their growth. Because they're a tiny little group. They don't have that expansion and multiplication. So at this point, the generations of Yaakov are small compared to how they will be. There's coming a day when they'll be, they will get their spiritual vav. Their supernatural expansion, I'm sorry, there's coming a day when they will get their uh, natural vav, their plural vav. I have this written down here wrong. And their spiritual expansion will meet up with their um, with their essence of being connected to God. Now this is real, so hang in there. I know it's complicated. Someone asked early about a word I'm going to use here coming up. Let me add something in here. So their spiritual, their natural expansion will take place, and that day is coming as part of the geulah. Anybody know what the word geulah means? So it's a Hebrew word, and everything is connected to geulah, which is the final redemption. 
This is what mankind has been waiting for. This is what the Jewish people are waiting for. Because until Israel gets to its place of its final redemption, everybody's waiting on that. It's our job as Messianic believers to do things in order to bring about the Geulah, the final redemption. The sooner the better, if you ask me. That's just my opinion. Some of you may want to stay here for a long time and continue to see things. But we're pushing towards that day of the final redemption, the day and time that we all await, which is connected to the Messiah coming back and ruling and reigning. Amen? You guys following this so far? So this missing Vav, who is this missing Vav in both of both of this, the sons of Esau, the generations of Esau, and the generations of Isaac, of Isaac, through his father, or through Jacob, Israel, through his father, uh, Isaac. Who was the one who did this? And three vavs, a vav in Hebrew is a, the nail or the uh, spike um, if you look at a door, not this door, but any door you have at home, a wooden door, and you have the hinges, the little piece, that would be a vav. So who's the missing vav? Yeshua is the missing vav. The descendants of Esau and Edom represent spiritually nominal Christianity. And look at the size of Christianity today. They have the size, but they're missing the vav. How are they missing the Bible? Wait, they have Jesus. But to a Jewish person looking at, they're, they're not representing the Messiah that they've been waiting for where they could recognize him. Just the same way they didn't recognize Joseph. Joseph had to expose himself and show himself to his, his family that he was an Egyptian. He was Jewish. He was like them. And he represents Messiah. He was a type and foreshadow of Messiah to the, not only the people of Israel, but when Joseph stored the food, who else did he save? He saved all the people around as well. Today, the Christians have size, but they're missing the Vav, the true Vav, because they're not representing the true Vav to the Jewish people. They're misrepresenting him. That being said, the Jewish people need the Christian Gentiles in order to bring about the Geulah, or the final redemption of the house of Israel. And we're going to get to, we haven't even got to the story of Jacob. This is all leading up to this. I usually don't have this much packed into, but this is too important to go through another year without talking about, because it's the basis for everything we do. Remember when Jacob, Yaakov, when he grabbed the heel of Esau, he grabbed the hill symbolizing the need for the Jewish people represented by Jacob to receive help from the Gentile Christian world represented by Esau. They both needed each other's help in order for the final redemption to come. Today they both need each other's help in order for the final redemption to come. Interesting. In order for the generations of Esau to receive their missing Vav, they must come together with the generations of Itzach, who is also in need of their missing Vav. Each of them have a piece that the other one needs, and until they both come together, neither of them will get the piece that they need. But wait a minute, Christians, you know, it's just about Jesus, and that's it. But Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He wasn't a Christian. He was a Jew who came back to fulfill what the prophet said he would do. And he did. That's one thing I like about the videos we're watching. And one thing I like about commenting on the pros and cons and the, that kind of thing about it. But this is connected to the foundational scripture of our congregation. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1. This is the way, I'm going to read our uh, foundational scripture is actually Isaiah 2, 3, but I'm going to read 1 through 5. 
This is the word that Yeshayahu Isaiah, the son of Amot, saw concerning Yehuda and Jerusalem. Jerusalem. In the Aharit Hayamim, the world to come, the mountain of Adonai's house will be established as the most important mountain. Do you remember they were talking about the mountain, Mount Gerizim, for the, the, uh, the Samaritans, and then Zion and Mount Moray, Mount Moriah? In the world to come, the mountain of Adonai's house will be established as the most important mountain. It will be regarded more high, highly than any other hills. And all the goyim, all the Gentiles, will stream there. And here's our foundational scripture here. Many peoples will go and say, when it says many peoples, it's saying many Gentiles. Many Gentile nations shall go and say, come, come on. Let us go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the house of the God of Yaakov. Let us go submit ourselves to the Jewish people in the house of the God of the Jews. Why? Because he would teach us about his ways. And we will walk in his paths. Why would they have to leave and go to the house of the Lord and go all the way to Israel if they're already learning about his ways and his paths where they were? Surely the Jews, no, 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 this is backwards. Surely the Jews are supposed to come in to the house of the Gentiles and surely that's what Scripture actually means. No. No. Doesn't mean that at all. It says that ten men from the nation shall grab the, the zitzi of a Jew and say, basically, we're going with you. Why? Because we hear God is with you. Hallelujah. Not something everyone wants to hear, but that's what the word says. Amen? Amen. We're going to leave off that. Oh, here we go. The end of verse 3. For out of Zion will go forth Torah. Wait a minute. This is after everything. This is after in the Aharit Hayamim, at the world to come. This is after the end of the book of Revelation. After the, book, the end of the book of Revelation, they're still teaching Torah from Israel. What's going on here? We know that's all been done away with, so people say, which doesn't agree with Scripture, but that's, they're welcome to say what they want to say. For out of Zion will go forth Torah and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem. Torah is still going out after the Gentiles make their way to Jerusalem. Verse 4. He will judge between the nations and arbitrate for many peoples. Well, how can he do that? Because they've submitted to him. You know, in a, in a, Israel, uh, a Jewish city, if there was a dispute, it wasn't enough for the judge to be sitting at the gate of the city if you didn't go up to him and have your case arbitrated before him. And it wouldn't be enough if you were to go to the gate of the city and have your case arbitrated before him and not... Um, Submit to the ruling that was given. Wouldn't be enough. It's showing they're there, recognizing who the, the good and fair and righteous judge is and submitting their self to him and receiving the judgment of between the nations and arbitrate uh, for many peoples. Then they will hammer their swords into plow blades and their spears into pruning knives. Nations will not rise, raise swords against each other, and they will no longer learn war. When? When the nations finally submit to the messianic authority that the Lord has established that he's told them about for thousands of years. Then they won't submit to the demons who came down, the watchers who came down the book of Enoch, and told men, showed men how to wage war with one another. They won't do that anymore. Not going to listen to the devil and his minions anymore. Going to listen to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Jerusalem, at his throne, that's when peace will come. 
until then, no peace without the Prince of Peace sitting on his throne. Limited peace at best. Verse 5, descendants of Yaakov, the Jewish people, come, let's live in the light of Adonai. It's the Gentiles are saying, hey, Jewish people, come on, come on. Let's live together in the light of Adonai. This is where we're going, and this is why we do what we do. You know, a Gentile's most important job, he's got one job, is to make the Jewish people zealous and jealous for relationship with the God of Israel. In particular, through the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. Amen? So we clearly see the Toldot, or the descendants of Yaakov and the descendants of Esau, serving and worshiping Adonai together. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but I did mention to you, the Toldot of Ishmael is missing both vavs. They neither, neither have the root of a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they don't have the plurality. You know, the, I hate saying this kind of stuff on camera. However, the word Arab comes from the word in Hebrew, Arev, or mixed. And the idea is that you don't know who they are. Because they're mixed. You don't know which nation they came from. But when you look at the nations, Esau and Edom, you have a clear understanding of who exactly they are. But the descendants of Ishmael, they don't have any, either of the Vavs. And I just leave that at that. And pray that they come to know Messiah as well, obviously, and clearly. Amen? So that brings us to today's portion, where we'll talk about a solution to this longstanding problem. A lot of my, um, what I'm teaching you today, and I'm not one to give plugs on books or to promote anybody's book. However, we're living in a time right now, guys, where it's just, it's just too important. So whether you like what I'm saying or don't like what you're saying, quite honestly, that's between you and the Father. Because I know what the truth is and what I'm teaching and showing. And this message has been going all out, all throughout the world and not only changing lives, but all through the world, those who are receiving, there's um, supernatural things taking place. Um, I'm not here to promote anybody in particular. You, I don't think you guys have ever seen me promote anybody or really say anybody's name, but I have to in this case. Um, if you want to know more about this, you can um, look up Rabbi, Rabbi Itzhak Shapira, his website, ahavatami.org, A H A V A T. A-M-M-I dot org. Ahavat Ami means for the love of my people. He's given his life for the salvation of the Jewish people. He came to know Messiah Yeshua through the writings of the rabbis. Um, writings that we would look upon and say, what's all that about? We don't even understand. But he saw Yeshua in there. I just leave that at that. Um, his book, The Basor of Cor According to COVID-19, I'm, I'm only telling you this because um, I have a um, a deep burden to see Messiah come back and to see this message get out because people are just all over the place and they don't know the truth um, without telling his story. And if you have to watch this rabbi or one of the students, you can correct me if I get a piece of this wrong. But long story short, the COVID broke out and the Lord started dealing with him. All of a sudden he went from everything was fine. He couldn't talk for six months he spent 18 to 20 hours for six or eight months, something like that, and got this book out. It sold, I mean, copies everywhere. Um, we got to meet those who were just, he got, just was put into Korean. We got to meet the young lady, just a typical Korean woman. Nothing that anybody would say anything spiritually, oh my gosh, very humble. Very sweet, very sincere. She translates into Korean. Korea, it's blowing up. Um, there's Korean, and um, also there is uh, 
it's in German, and it's just coming out in German. There's a bunch of different. I'll leave it at that. Ahavada means for the love of my people. So if you want to look into some of this, you can find it in his book. But I want to pick up what I'm teaching here and continue in actually today's Torah portion, which is Parashat Vayetze. Or Jacob, it's talking about when he, uh, when he goes out or when he went. And here's where the story picks up. So remember we talked about these stories are all connected. They're not separate. Genesis 28.10, okay? Yaakov went out from Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there, stay, stayed the night there because the sun had set. He took a stone from the place and put under his head and lay down there to sleep. He dreamt that there before him was a ladder resting on the ground with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels, or in Hebrew, Chamalachim, of Adonai were going up and down on it. This is the biggest thing in the story, the Jacob's ladder. I remember, you know, as kids, you'd see the, you'd have the yarn and you'd do the whole Jacob's ladder thingy. Everybody ever do that? Yeah. And up until I was an adult, that's all I knew about it. Sadly, today, that's what most people know about it, is that. But I want to talk about this. First thing I want you to notice is, notice the ladder is set up on earth, which allowed travel from earth up to heaven. Because it says on it, uh, let's see here. Yeah, he dreamt that, that before him was a ladder resting on the ground with its top reaching heaven. So you get the idea in the bottom going up. The word malachim or malach is an angel, malachim, plural angels, that they use here. It's translated into English as angels. So for the better part of my life, and most people, I had this idea of angels just kind of floating up and down, and you know, you see them with the wings and maybe with the harp, you know. You see this idea of a little fat angel with a, a bow and arrow shooting people in the backside, causing them to fall in love, all these kind of things that aren't biblical. They're traditional. They're, you know, nothing to do with this. So this word malachim, that's translated as angels, it just means messengers. Messengers. So someone, you know, came to the door with a message, you know, a telegram, just a messenger, a, ma a malach, a messenger. Now, these are malachim, messengers of God. But the latter is, in is from the ground going up. As we mentioned before, we imagine angels ascending from heaven. But I want to note something. If this ladder was meant for them to travel on, then it would say the ladder came down from heaven. Because the angels live in heaven, and for them to get to earth, they have to come down the ladder. That makes sense? But it doesn't say that. And it doesn't say this, it doesn't say it in Hebrew, and it doesn't even say it in English. So we're clear that there's no bad translation of this for this particular purpose. But it says they're going up. They're making aliyah, and then they're coming down. So remember that as we continue, the origin of the use of the ladder is from earth up making Aliyah to heaven. Concerning this ladder, the Hebrew name for ladder is Sulam. It's not connected to Shalom. It's not a, the letter is a Samech. It's not a Sheen. When it's a Samech, it's a, you know, you, um, that's related to Sheen. You have the emblem of God, the, um, we call him El Shaddai. This is a totally different letter, which indicates, um, well, I, I just leave that part. It's a totally different, it's not connected to shalom or shalem to pay for. But how many of you know that Torah is always trying to tell us something? Yeah. And how many of you know that we can't limit how the Lord speaks? I, I hate to bring up Christianity in a negative way. I always want to do it in a teaching way, and people can believe it or not. You can make your own decisions about things. 
But Christianity, nominal Christianity by and large, has an attitude of putting God in a specific box and limiting how he can react based on more of a Greek understanding of um, just the natural. You know, I understand this box here. It has sides. It has a top, a bottom. It has limitations. I recognize how much I can put in there. I can put, you know, this book in there, you know, but I can't put my car in there, obviously. But in Hebrew, it's different. Things are more in concepts or ideas. So Scripture says something along the line of, well, he put his car in this box. If you think in your natural mind and it trips you up because you recognize it can't fit in there, that's what I'm talking about. Hebrew doesn't work like that. If it says that there's, there's either something you don't understand or missing or it's a concept or something else outside of this idea of these limiting things that the natural Western logic, where does logic come from? The Greeks. It's outside of that. I'm not here to criticize that. I'm just telling you the reality. So don't think like that. Don't put God in any boxes or limit him how he can manifest and do something in your life and someone else's life, whatever the case is. I might give you examples, you know, a pretty, a, a pretty basic example. Uh, Melchizedek, Melchizedek. Who was that? It's Messiah. But if you think about a nice, neat little box where you can fit, you may say, well, that doesn't fit, so I don't believe it. That's up to you. Um, we believe it. Scripture tells it pretty evidently. So just keep that mindset. And the next thing I talked about, or we talked about earlier, is don't do what? Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. I'm just telling you for your sake. As soon as you get into that kind of mentality, you're going to miss out on things that the Lord is trying to show you because it doesn't fit into that nice. Can I see your nice little neat? You have a nice little neat box over there? No? Okay. Everybody has these little boxes, and they vary in sizes and shape. But yes, but at the same time, they're limiting. Don't, don't do that. So you've been warned. Hallelujah. Let me find where I left off here. Ah, here we go. Hebrew word for ladder is sulam. And it starts off with the word vehini, or Behold. Vigene um, Sulam. Let me see something is that what it says right here. Yeah, where is it? Here we go. Yeah. Verse 12. Vaya halom vigene sulam. Behold. When you hear that word behold, even in English it sounds like, oh, I need to pay attention. Something important is about to be said. Vehene or behold in Hebrew, whenever you see this, stop and take notice. But it says, behold this ladder. The ladder is connected to the end of days. It's connected to us today. And I'll talk more about that later on. But this ladder connects the kingdom of God to the kingdom here on earth. Yeah? Pretty evident, pretty clear. There are seven different Hebrew verb tenses. And in the context of the dream, the latter was in place before the time of creation. Remember, don't put that in the box. Quit, quit trying to close the lid on that box. It's not going to fit in there. Take your hand off the box. <laughs> not going to fit in there. The rabbis of Israel said that the latter, this is the rabbis of Israel. They said that the ladder, the ladder represents Messiah. They said that. And that in order to be able to travel between the kingdom above and the kingdom below, you needed a way to do so. So that was the way of the ladder. It served two purposes, to receive building instructions from the kingdom above and to be able to awaken the heavens by going up. The ladder's not a thing. The rabbi said the ladder's not a thing. It's a person. It's Messiah. So it's Yeshua who connects both kingdoms together. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom on earth. 
you know, in the Star of David, people say all kinds of weird stuff. Just remember about it that, like everything else, man perverts. The Lord doesn't. The Star of David is two triangles. One pointing to heaven, one pointing to earth. And the way it's configured, it's interwoven, so you can't separate the two. They're all together as one. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in heaven as it is on earth. Okay, are you guys getting this? I know this is a lot more than I usually do, but I got to get through this. In Hebrew, here's another thing. In Hebrew, each letter has a numeric value. You know, in America, we use Arabic numbers. We don't realize it. We think, oh, they're English numbers. Surely these were invented in London. King Henry, 1850 to 1870, he came up with these numbers and these letters. Surely that's where it came from, right? No. They're Arabic numerals. Remember the Roman numerals that were used in Europe? They didn't make it. Many Roman things made it to America. They didn't make it here. I had a lady, a uh, wonderful sister from Zimbabwe, uh, as part of the yeshiva. She, we were talking about things. and Talking about tea. How do you like your tea? It's like it hot. <laughs> you know, and she said, you don't want any, you know, milk in and not. I just want. And they asked me the same thing in the airplane. Well, would you like anything? You don't want anything in it? No milk? No, I just want hot tea. You have honey? No, hot tea is fine. But she said to me, she said, you know, it just seems like everything you Americans do is exactly opposite of the British. If the British did this, and you do the exact opposite. And I can't remember what, the, what brought this up in the conversation. But there's this American idea that we just, you know, and it slipped into the church, into the minds of believers to automatically get rid of something if we don't understand it. In Hebrew letters, each has a numeric value. You know, you hear Christians say all the time, oh, 777, that's my number. Why? Because they see 777 representing the Lord. Well, they don't realize it represents the seven days of creation and all these different things. 666, oh my gosh, that's the Antichrist. They have no problem with that. If you bring up the word numerology, you bring up the word gematria, they go, the same people. <gasps> but 777. Probably on some of your passwords on some account somewhere. You need to have some numbers in it. It's probably a seven if you're a Christian. Even English words, A is representative of one. B would be two. All the way till you get to ten, then it doesn't really relate. But in Hebrew, the letters mean as much numerically as they do Aleph, Bet, Ali. If I can coin a new word there. And Adonai has placed within these values clues and deeper meaning. But sadly, like every other beautiful thing Adonai has created, evil has grabbed a hold of it and perverted it. When I see a rainbow, I think about the promises of God. What do you think about? Hallelujah. When I see a wedding ring or hear the word husband or hear the word wife, I think about it as it relates to what the Father said. Amen? Not what anything else is. You know, there's a standard. Torah is our standard. Amen? But the original creation of Adonai remains useful and ordinate even if people pervert things. That being said, I want to point out a few instances of this that are ordinate from Adonai placed in Scripture in order to give us more understanding and insight. And these are especially helpful and clearly when they clearly point out Messiah. You know, if someone had any type of book, a William Shakespeare book or a book by this or that one, what if it pointed to Messiah and they received Messiah because of that? What would you say about that? Would you say, oh, that's just William Shakespeare. And that's just ridiculous. Oh, that's just a bunch of nonsense and myths and this and that. But wait a minute. He just received Messiah through it that the Lord used it. Just because it's outside of your... Let me see that pretty little box again. You have it right there still? Oh, she, she got rid of it. Wonderful. <laughs> Just because it doesn't fit in your nice little box 
Doesn't mean the Lord isn't doing it. Don't put God in a little box. I want to remind you that if you don't understand something, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Which sadly is a very Christian thing to do as it relates to Jewish understanding that's misunderstood and then perverted by some. Rather seek further understanding. Amen. Hallelujah. And it's difficult. It's not easy. I, I'm just going to tell you. You never say that he said, you know, the bald headed guy out there, he said it was easy and wonderful and all that. No, I never told you that. So if I see you on the street, well, hi, hey, how you doing? Didn't tell you it was easy. But I'll tell you, it's worth it. Hallelujah. The Hebrew term mutsav artsa, or set up on earth, referring to the latter, has a numeric value of 434. You can write this down if you want or just listen. The term Mashiach ben David, who we all know as Yeshua the Messiah, also has a numerical value of 434. The rabbi said that the latter was Yeshua. Or they said it was Messiah. They should have recognized it's Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach, who is sent down to earth, who provides each of us the authorization and the ability to ascend the ladder into heaven. The ladder, or sulam in Hebrew, is also called, can be called kevis, which also can be interpreted as the lamb. Hallelujah. Yeshua is the lamb and the ladder whom we climb to get to the Father in heaven. The term in Genesis 28, 12, Vihene Sulam, behold, behold, a ladder. I remember going to Christian plays. You know, they have an Easter play, and you'd hear, behold, the Son of God. And people would, you'd, in the audience, go, ooh, my gosh. Because that's what they're saying. Vihene, behold, look. Hallelujah. Vihene Sulam in Genesis 28, 12 has a numer numeric value of 196. It's the same as the Hebrew term Veketz and the end. Our ability to climb the ladder, Yeshua, will also be how we'll overcome in the end. All points to Yeshua. The Hebrew word sulam has a numeric value. I'm just going to throw all these out there at you, of 130. The same as the word for Sinai, Sinai. The connection between Torah and Messiah. Hallelujah. Climbing up the ladder of Yeshua is the way you'll be able to survive and overcome in the end. Also, the term ze kisei hakavod, or in English, this is the seat of glory, has the same numeric value. The rungs of the ladder are the covenants of Israel, including the Torah through Messiah. So we're literally able, we're literally able to go up and down to the Father in heaven through and by the ladder of Yeshua, the Messiah. In Genesis 28, 12, the word Hebrew, bo, is used, which can mean come or go. It can refer to something, um, a person or an inanimate object. It's used to describe a person rather than a thing. In Genesis 28, referring to Messiah. And in John 1, Chapter 50, or verse 51, we see this same Hebrew concept being alluded to. John 1, 51, Then he said to him, Yes, indeed, I tell you that you will see heaven open and the angels of God going up and coming down on, on the Son of Man. John 1, 51. The latter doesn't represent an object, but the person who can connects the two kingdoms. 
<coughs> excuse me, Messiah Yeshua. His name is Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah of Israel. And I can go through many more of these, but we're out of time. So I don't want to keep, I think I give you a lot for one service. When the nations who have the Vav of multiplication in numbers come together under, under the divinely ordained leadership of the Jews who have the Vav or the essence of the word Toldot, coming to the Christians and the Gentiles in need of the Vav of the, the multitude, the plurality, when they come together, when you get both together, both groups end up with both Vavs. And both then can become the completed generations of Adonai. Can't do it without one another. And the generations of Messiah. The missing Vav will bring both of them, the essence and the root of the word, and the multiplication, the numbers of people. What does that mean? You see the situation we're in today? Where you have the Christians over here. You have the Jews over here. You have the Messianics in the middle. Both of them look at us funny. The Christians think we're too Jewish and the Jews think we're too Christian. And it's our job to make the Jews jealous and it's our job to enlighten and show the Christians. And both of them, Scripture tells us, have certain things that have been blocked from them. Scales on their eyes to a certain degree. But we don't know who has what scales. So it's up to us to continue to minister in both directions and pray that those who have an ear to hear will hear. You know, it's not just Shema Israel. It's Shema to the nations. This word you'll hear a lot, Geulah. That's the, 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 um, uh, the final redemption. You'll hear, you know, there's a zillion Hebrew terms. I don't want to overwhelm you with them where you get confused. Don't know Geula from Besorah or, you know, whatever. So we do a few at a time. But this is what humanity is praying for everyone, is the final redemption, the day when Messiah comes back. Hallelujah. It's our job today to climb up the ladder, bringing God's kingdom from heaven down with us here on earth, and to bring as many people up the ladder with us as we can, both Jew and Gentile alike. So how do we climb the ladder? We do it with love of Torah, just as Yeshua told us to do. We do it with love of the mitzvot, or the commands of God, the, the deeds. Because what did he say? If you love me, you'll do what? You do the things that I said for you to do. How can you love your brother or sister and not do anything for him? You can't do it. And with the love of Messiah, Yeshua, all working in harmony together. All three have to be together. Just as Scripture shows. Contrary to what's taught in a lot of Christian circles, Oh, we don't have to do any mitzvot, any deeds. We don't do that kind. That doesn't matter anymore. Really? So are you saying that the Lord says you to do whatever you want to do? That he never tells you to do something right unto or for someone else? Are you saying that? Well, no. No Christian would actually say that. But we don't do No, you don't do that anymore for salvation. But you do it because you love the Lord. Tell that to your mom and dad at home. Oh, I don't do, you know, take out the trash. And mom, I don't do that kind of stuff. Don't, I don't have to do any of that type of stuff. Well, you render yourself not pleasing and you, you, um, you, don't, you hurt the relationship. You know, when children listen to the parents and they do things, the parents never even asked. You know, you go to the laundry room and there's, there was a stack of laundry last night, but you get up and this morning, oh my gosh, the laundry's all done and fought, even asked. They did it, they folded it and everything else. And you say, they, love, they really love me. They love me so much they actually do and they're showing me how much they love me. Messiah said, if you love me, you'll keep my command. Amen. Doing the good works of the Father because of our love for him and his son, all the while empowered to do so by the Ruach HaKodesh. 
And like I said, there's a lot of other things I could have touched on, but I think that was a lot for one night. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you for the word that we've heard. And I pray, Lord, that it would fall upon ears that are ready to hear. And we'll go down into hearts, Lord, that have been watered and tilled and fertilized, just waiting for a word to come that can be planted and will grow. And not just grow, Lord, but continue to grow and to produce, produce fruit, Lord. Produce fruit for your kingdom, for your kingdom's glory, O oh God. So we thank you and praise you for that. We ask you to continue to use us, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us, Lord. And we thank you, O oh God, that you give us the heart not to give up on anyone in the congregation, Lord. Not to give up on anyone in our lives, Lord. Even when it looks like they're, they're uh, hopeless, we don't give up, O oh God. We continue to believe the best of one another. We continue to believe, O oh God, that you have good plans for us, Lord. We continue to believe, Lord, that each week we are called to come together to worship you, Lord. And just like Abraham's tent, to have the tent doors swung open wide for all of those to come, for the Catholics to come and the Baptists, O oh God, for the Mormons and the atheists, Lord, for the Presbyterians and the Word of Faith people. We thank you for that, everyone in between, Lord. We even thank you, Lord, in the last conference there was a Muslim man who had received Messiah miraculously. We thank you for the Muslims, O oh God, that will come to know Messiah. We thank you, Lord. They're just their cousins, oh God. I thank you for my natural cousins, too, that they will come to know Messiah. So we thank you for all of this, Lord, as we continue in our service. We thank you for your blessing, your great peace, your great help, in the mighty name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.